Turn with me back to the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. I shared last week I was going to begin a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And last week we covered several of the, the uh, blessed Beatitudes. This morning we're going to conclude uh, on the second part of the Beatitudes. We're going to, I want to, just for the sake of uh, refreshing your memory, let me remind you that the word blessing, the word blessing in Latin is Beatus. Uh, we learn that Jesus, there were two, two Greek words that were translated blessed in the New Testament. The one that Jesus uses here relates to the spiritual blessings upon those who are born again believers. He's referring to the children of God uh, when he uses this word blessed or blessed. So we're, for the sake of re reminding you, we're going to jump back and we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to cover the Beatitudes in verses 8 through 12 this morning. But it says in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him. I'm in Matthew chapter 5. In verse 2 it says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, I want you to pay special attention beginning in verse 8. We're going to read through verse 12. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for that spiritual blessedness that you promised to all who inherit eternal life. Lord, we thank you for the possibility of that eternal life that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ, for we know there is no other way but through Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice upon the cross, for the shedding of his blood, for the redemption of our sins. Lord, we thank you that you raised him from the tomb. Lord, we thank you that one of these days he's coming back. Lord, we pray that there will be more in the multitude that he gathers together in the flock. And fewer that die and go to hell as a result of the preaching of your word. Lord, forgive us where we fed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, we're going to focus on the Beatitudes beginning in verse 8 this morning. And really, we, we find there are four blessed statements, but uh, the last two, the last two statements kind of go together. They, they speak of the persecuted, those who are, are reviled for the name of Jesus, for the sake of simply being a Christian. Now, we're going to get to that in just a moment, but I want us to look at verse 8. It says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I want you to notice that each one of the Beatitudes, each and every one of the Beatitudes has a blessing that follows it. Uh, and this blessing is going to be bestowed upon those who are born again believers, those who are considered children of God. Keep in mind that Jesus has begun calling his disciples, that the multitudes of people have been hearing Jesus teach in the synagogues. And so he's he's raised himself up on the side of the mount or up on a, a raised position so that he can sit there and he can teach these people. He can teach them more concerning the kingdom of God and what it means to be a Christian. And so he says in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now some, some would point out, in fact, that this purity and this singleness points all the way back to the Old Testament. It talks about seeing God face to face. Now we know back in the Old Testament days that uh, the Bible says that no man can look upon God's face. We know when, when Moses uh, uh, was hidden in the cleft of the rock that he simply saw the backside of God as he passed by and his hair turned white so that when he reappeared before the people from coming down from Mount Sinai, the glory of God shone round about Moses. But I want you to look specifically 
to this point. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart. Do you consider yourself pure in heart this morning? The Bible tells us that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Think about that. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. But yet Jesus says here, blessed are the pure in heart. What does it mean to have a pure heart? It means that your thoughts and your feelings and your responses, it means that everything that you are and everything that you do is a reflection of the heart of God in your life. Now my friend, let me tell you, how to receive a pure heart. <clears throat> Receiving a pure heart is as simple as obeying the gospel. Because the righteousness of Christ becomes imputed righteousness to you. When you surrender to His will, when you accept His sacrifice, when you identify Him as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, as the Son of God, God takes out that old stony heart, that old deceitful heart, and He replaces it with a heart of flesh, a tender heart, a gracious heart, a compassionate heart, a merciful heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, this is a, a reward that's reserved. It's a privilege of the saints. Because their heart has been purged from dead works and their soul has been cleansed from sin. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've heard me repeat that verse over and over and over. You may say, well, preacher, why do you repeat that one verse over and over and over? It's because, my friends, until you realize, until you come to, to an account and recognizing your sinful state, recognizing your eternal destination, you see, as opposed to some religions that teach that when you die, that's simply it. The Bible gives us instructions and says, simply instructs us in this way and says that when you die, you have to go either one place or the other. Either to everlasting life in which God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the angels inhabit and all of the saints who have been listed in the Lamb's Book of Life. Or you enter into eternal punishment. You might say, preacher, why are you so certain that hell exists? Because the Bible, the New Testament specifically, speaks of hell more than it does heaven. Jesus even used the example of the rich man and Lazarus, pointing out the reality that once you die, if you die apart from Christ, you continue to live. If you look at the example that Jesus gave, Concerning the rich man, he was able to see, he was able to hear, he was able to suffer, he was able to speak. If you die apart from Christ, it doesn't mean simple annihilation. It doesn't mean, and it's over. But rather it means that your eternal judgment has just begun. I want you to consider this for a moment. In the blessing of this beatitude for the pure in heart, Job, we're all familiar with the story of Job. Job was a man of God. Job lost all he had. Job lost his family. Job lost his health. But Job didn't lose his life. His friends would come to Job and say, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? You see, that thought was, Job, why don't you just curse God and it'll all be over? But Job knew better. 
Some of his friends came to him and said, Joe, you've got unconfessed sin in your life. Get it right with God. And yet Joe, Joe never cursed God. As a matter of fact, in the 19th chapter of Job, we read verses 26 and 27. It says, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. What Job was pointing out was his perseverance to endure the trials on this earth. His perseverance and the assurance that he would see God in his eternal kingdom. John MacArthur says that not only with the perception of faith, but in the glory of heaven. You see, for the child of God, we can rest assured as we know God here on this earth, we shall see him face to face when we enter into glory. What are the assurances of being a child of God? My friend, do you want to go to heaven? And accept the purity in heart which comes through the imputed righteousness of Christ. Secondly, I want us to look at verse 9. It said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The peacemaker, who is the peacemaker? The peacemaker is the one who is kind to man and beast. Adam Clark's commentary says, For uh, as war distracts and divides nations, families, and individuals from each other, inducing them to pursue different objects and, di and different interests, so peace restores them to a state of unity, giving them one object and one interest. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Those who are peaceable. Those who strive to prevent contention and strife and war and discontent. My friend, are you a peacemaker? You can be a peacemaker when you come to the understanding as Job. You can be a peacemaker when you understand that, listen, God is sovereign. You can be a peacemaker you, even though you face all of the hatred and persecution. You can be a peacemaker when someone tries to push your button. And let's face it, folks, we all have those buttons, do we not? Years ago, there was a, ad, an advertising campaign that came out with one office supply company. And online, you could purchase these little buttons. They were red buttons. Now, we've oftentimes wanted to push the red button. Here a few years ago, one of our former presidents was uh, uh, invoking, invoking his rage against another foreign country in regards to their nuclear weapons. And he made the statement, he said, I have more than you do and mine, my button works. In the advertising campaign that this office company put out, and you could order these little buttons online and, and you could reach up and you could press that button and all of a sudden you'd hear a recorded voice say, that was easy. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. We're peacemakers because ultimately we understand that God is in control of all things. You see, today God is working out his will and his way. If you don't believe that God is sovereign, read the scriptures where he's working it all out. He has been since the very beginning of mankind, since the very beginning of time. God is working out His will and His way. He's given, given us His promise that one of these days, my friend, Jesus is coming back. And I believe that it's not too far away. Amen. 
In Matthew chapter 5 and verses 43 through 45, it says, Jesus, Jesus speaks these words. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. It says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Many say that ultimately this is a reference, and they term this theology or term this in, in regards to theology as common grace. In the last part of verse 45, it says this, For he maketh his son to rise on evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. You see, you can be a peacemaker. You can have peace in your heart knowing ultimately that God, that God will be victorious. You can know this according to the scriptures that one of these days Jesus is coming back and he's going to judge both the living and the dead. <coughs> Some will be granted eternal life. Some will be condemned to everlasting judgment. You see, today we rest with the assurance, with the assurance of God's Word. Therefore, we should have peace in our hearts. And if you notice this scripture verse in Matthew in chapter 5 and verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Some other translations say sons of God. The Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary says it was not till Christ made peace by the blood on the cross that God could manifest himself as the God of peace. As a matter of fact, the Pauline writer wrote in the book of Hebrews, Now the God of peace that brought again the, from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood, of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that is that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children or the sons of God. Lastly, I want us to consider what verses 10 through 12 tell us. It says in verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Do you know what persecuted means? If you go back and you look to the original Greek language, the original Greek word here for persecute or persecuted literally means to be pursued, to be followed. Literally what we might say is to be chased. Now, there have been times in my life when I was chased. Sometimes I wanted to be caught. Amen, sir? Where are you at? I'm going to tell you something. I didn't give up too soon. But then there were other times when I was being chased that I didn't want to be caught. Mainly when my mama was chasing me around the house. Or my daddy, I'll, I'll never forget. I mean, you could always tell when daddy was unhappy because you'd hear that belt go. <laughs> no, I'm, my parents didn't chase me too often. They gave me fair warning. Don't you run from me. My, both of my kids, both of our kids, they love to run. They go out on jogs and run. Now I've asked them quite often, why are you running? What are you running from? Well, I'm running to get exercise. I said, is something chasing you? No. I said, well, you won't catch me running unless there's something big and bad that's chasing you. But the word persecuted literally means that something is after you. They're constantly on your, on your tail. They're constantly pursuing you. 
And the scripture gives us the reason for that pursuit. It says for righteousness sake, for those who are being pursued for righteousness sake, for those who are being pursued because they carry the name of Christ, for those who are being chased for bearing the name Christian. The writer of James says in James in chapter 5 and verses 10 and 11, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. In verse 11, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You see, we're called to persevere. We're called to endure. I love the way the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, which we adopted several years ago, I love the way that it states it, that we believe that all true believers shall endure to the end. Paul wrote to the church at Corinthians, he said, to, at Corinth, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, he says, even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer, and some translations say we endure. We endure. Why do we endure? Because we are pure in heart. Because we've been called to be peacemakers. Because we carry the name of Christ. <coughs> because for righteousness sake, it gives us the promise of eternal life and receiving the kingdom of heaven. If you look with me in verse 12, and sometimes this is the most difficult, the most difficult, the most difficult statement in the Bible, especially when we're being pursued, when we're being persecuted, especially when we're being talked about, when we're being reviled, Especially when we are being accused. And my friends, let me make, make a very bold statement here. You have received nothing in comparison to what Jesus endured on the cross. He was mocked. He was spat upon. He had the crown, the, the, the crown of thorns, not placed on his head, but pressed on his head. He endured the spikes in his hands and in his feet. He endured it not only the mockery from the ground, but from those also being crucified beside him. One of the thieves on the cross. But if you are who you say you are, get yourself down in the process. Take us with you. But to the one on his right, he said, Lord, remember me. To him, Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Verse 12 says, Rejoice and be ex exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, one of the, you've heard me say this before. Yeah. One of the curses of America. 
is not that we're Americans. One of the curses of America is that we've been blessed up until this point, that we've not had to endure persecution or hatred. We've not had to endure murder because of or on account of our faith. Our forefathers saw from the very beginning, from the very origin of our country, our forefathers saw that in, in regards to Americans, we would have the right to worship our God freely. Aside from hatred and persecution, apart from killing and murder. But yet we read of our brothers and sisters who are overseas, who are dying for their faith in that they are faced with a choice of either denouncing Christ or being burned or maimed or murdered. Many today see their spouses, many men who refuse to denounce their faith in Jesus Christ, see their spouses raped and their children abducted. If they came knocking on your door today, would you, could you endure it for the name of Jesus? Ponder on that. Ponder on that. Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be exceeding glad in verse 12. For great is your reward in heaven. If it happened to Jesus, and we're living a life for Christ, we should expect no less. Some of you may be here this morning, you may be thinking, Preacher, why would I want to go through all of that? <laughs> Look at the reward. The kingdom heaven. Do you realize that when you become a child of the king, you become an heir to the kingdom? That is your inheritance. It's something that is promised that you have not yet, but you soon, you soon will have. And I can tell you this, as much as I love this life, I love this world. I love my family. I love my home. I love being around you for the most part. It's just a drop in the bucket of what awaits me in the kingdom of God. I like getting up in the morning, not real early. I like going out and seeing the dew on the ground and hearing the cows holler in the distance. Y'all know me, I like to get on my tractor and I like to cut and bale hay. Lord and I have had a lot of conversations on the, on the seat of a tractor. I love to go to the lake and go camping. I like to go to the woods and go hunting. Now I notice I said hunting, it's not always killing. Most of the time you're looking. Last year I was sitting on the deer stand. Just me and the Lord. And the sun began to crack dawn. And the birds began chirping. And the squirrels began scurrying around on the ground. And out walks these little deer. And I just sat there and I watched. I watched them as they nibbled around on the ground, as they walked across the lane and entered back into the woods. 
And I thought, Lord, this is a lie. But you know what? The life, true life, the way awaits me in heaven. My friend, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you something. There is so much better waiting for you in heaven than you could ever experience or own on this earth. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me make this very clear. You can either be obedient to the Word of God and accept Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for your sins, having your sins wiped away and inheriting everlasting life, or you can be condemned to an eternal judgment. The key word there is eternal. Not annihilation. Eternal. Just as the rich man looked up out of hell and heaven and saw Lazarus resting in Abraham's bosom. He himself was tormented in the flame. <coughs> the scripture tells us in regards to that place that there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now where do you want to go? Let me tell you here this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have but one choice. And that is to take up your cross and follow Him. As His Word speaks to your ears and His Spirit stirs your heart, Understand that apart from Christ, you cannot receive everlasting life and enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so the choice that you make, perhaps this very morning, will determine your eternal destiny, whether you enter into heaven or you're judged and condemned to hell. Where do you stand with Jesus Christ in your life? Where Jesus said in regards to the children of God, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Are you one of the blessed this morning? God is speaking to your heart. He's calling you to salvation. He's calling you to be saved. Will you respond to simply doing this? We're going to have a time in a moment where our musicians, Brother Don, will come and lead us during a time of invitation, dedication. If you're ready to receive Christ this morning, will you simply do me a favor and step out of the aisle and come and have a seat on the front row? Listen, I promise there's nothing wrong with these front rows just because nobody sits here. Actually, to be honest with you, they're probably more soft and cushy than where you're at because all the seats at the back get wore out. Will you allow me to share with you more about what it means to receive Christ? We have another pastor in the congregation, Brother Don Cochran. He'd be more than happy to share with you what it means to have a relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We have deacons and Sunday school teachers. We'd be happy to share with you their testimony in what Christ has done for them and is willing to do for you. You simply have come and have a seat on the front row. Christian friend, have you ever considered the cost? The cost? The price that Jesus paid? You know, we tend, we tend to receive the gospel and we tend to forget about the sacrifice. The gospel apart from the sacrifice is nothing, my friend. It's not the gospel. If you, if you, one of those Christians, you've forgotten about 
the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross and the debt that he paid that you owed. Sometimes we need to stir, have our heart stirred within us. And we need to confess our sin, repent of those sins which are preventing a close and a close fellowship with our Heavenly Father. If we're ever going to receive the kingdom of heaven, we better, we better start now. We better start now. Will you get it right, Lord? Let's stand together and have a word of prayer. It's our music in the Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, let us not forget Apart from the preaching of your word and the sacrifice, Lord, there is no way to enter into eternal life, to receive the kingdom of heaven, to have our sins forgiven. Lord, we pray this morning simply your will would be done. That more people might be saved and have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And fewer people be judged in eternal torment, a place called hell reserved for the devil and his demons and all of those who are not children of God. Lord, call us to remembrance that the pure in heart are blessed, that the peacemakers are blessed, that the people who endure persecution because they're a Christian are blessed. Blessed with, with rewards, Lord, that will never decay. Where moths will not destroy and thieves cannot steal. Lord, once again we pray simply your will be done this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you come this morning? God's love in your heart.